A few housekeeping notes. Live automated captions are available. If the captions did not show up for you automatically, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to view subtitles. Before we start our library program, we'd like to share a land acknowledgement. We'd like to recognize the indigenous people whose land we are on today. Highline College itself and where many of us live and work resides on ancestral native lands of the Duwamish nation. And depending on exact cities in this region, many of us live and work on the Muckleshoot, Duwamish and Puyallup nations indigenous lands. We honor the land and give gratitude to the First Nations people that are here who continue to steward the land since time immemorial. To learn more about native land, check out the Native Land Project, an interactive map that we'll link to in the chat. We also encourage you to learn more about indigenous studies through our library resource guide linked in the chat. This guide includes books, eBooks, and websites revolving around Native American indigenous studies. Please reach out to us with additional suggestions for information sources to add to this guide. If you are able, we also encourage you to consider taking action to show solidarity by donating to a cause such as Real Rent Duwamish. Further, we respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people, primarily of African descent, who provided exploited labor on who on which this country was built with little to no recognition. Today, we are indebted to their labor and the labor of many black and brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows for our collective benefit. We encourage you to learn more about our black studies on our anti-racist resource library guide. Please reach out to us with additional suggestions for information resources to add to this guide. Thank you all. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gloria Rose Kepping, psychologist and faculty counselor from the Counseling Center. Dr. Kepping has worked at the college for 34 years. She'll read from the book, Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals by Alexis Pauline Gums. The book was published by AK Press 2020. Please stay for an optional brief discussion afterwards. That's all for housekeeping details. Let's get comfortable everyone and welcome Dr. Gloria Rose Kevin. Thank you, Karen. Preface, a guide to undrowning. What is the scale of breathing? You put your hand on your individual chest as it rises and falters all day. But is that the scale of breathing? You share air and chemical exchange with everyone in the room, everyone you pass by today. Is the scale of breathing within one species? All animals participate in this exchange of release for continued life but not without the plants. The plants in their inverse process release what we need, take what we give without being asked. And the planet wrapped in ocean breathing, breathing into sky. What is the scale of breathing? You are part of it now. You are not alone. And if the scale of breathing is collective, beyond species and sentience, so is the impact of drowning. The massive drowning, yet unfinished, where the distance of the ocean meant that people could become property, that life could be for sale. I am talking about the Middle Passage and everyone who drowned 
and everyone who continued breathing. But I am troubling the distinction between the two. I am saying that those who survived in the underbellies of boats under each other, under unbreathable circumstances, are the unground. And their breathing is not separate from the drowning of their kin and fellow captives. Their breathing is not separate from the breathing of the ocean. Their breathing is not separate from the sharp exhale of hunted whales, their kindred also. Their breathing did not make them individual survivors. It made a context the context of undrowning. Breathing in unbreathable circumstances is what we do every day in the chokehold of racial, gendered, ableist capitalism. We are still undrowning. And by we, I don't only mean people like myself whose ancestors specifically survived the Middle Passage, because the scale of our breathing is planetary at the very least. Are you still breathing? This is an offering toward our evolution, toward the possibility that instead of continuing the trajectory of slavery, entrapment, separation, and domination, and making our atmosphere unbreathable, we might instead practice another way to breathe. I don't know what that will look like, but I do know that our marine mammal kindred are amazing at not drowning. So I call on them as teachers, mentors, guides, and I call on you as breathing kindred souls. May we evolve. Chapter two, breathe. Breath is a practice of presence. One of the physical characteristics that unites us with marine mammals is that they process air in a way similar to us. Though they spend most or all of their time in water, they do not have gills. We too, on land, are often navigating contexts that seem impossible for us to breathe in, and yet we must. The adaptations that marine mammals have made in relationship to breathing are some of the most relevant for us to observe not only in relationship to our survival in an atmosphere we have polluted on a planet where we are causing the ocean to rise, but also in relationship to our intentional living, our mindful relation to each other. With meditations on the different ways that narwhal, beluga, and bowhead whales breathe in the Arctic, the ways baby seals learn to redefine breath in infancy. The relationship between the endangered North Atlantic right whale and my Shinnecock and enslaved ancestors, and even a surprise visit by a black tip reef shark. This section offers us opportunities to look at what blocks our breathing and the stakes of a society that puts profit over breath. May our breathing open up to the possibility of peace. There is more than one way to breathe in the Arctic. Ask the narwhal, beluga, and bowhead whales. Beluga shape shifts, evolve to look like ice itself, and congregates in the shallow estuaries, singing. Narwhal stays in deeper water, nearer to pack ice, grows a horn to break through, changes color over its life, needs no other teeth, just the one. Bowhead says bigger is better and moves alone, strong enough to break ice with a bare skull, old enough to remember before all of this, never stops growing. And you, Maybe it's time to remember that there is more than one way to breathe in icy depths or summer heat. To thank your ancestors for how you have evolved in the presence of polar bears, harpoons, and other threats. To think on what you want to shift, how you want to grow, what you need to remember. And me, 
It was always you I loved, not your elegant strategy. I love you still if you now outgrow it. I will love you more whether time moves forward or backwards, whether ice melts or water freezes back, whether your next move is protection, breakthrough, shift, or any combination. There are at least three ways to love you, as you were, as you are, as you will be. I love you. That means I choose all three. The baby Weddell seal has not grown into her flippers. She is awkward. She does not want to swim. She does not know she can breathe underwater. No one has told her about the great oxygenating capacity of her blood. She doesn't know that the milk her mother gives her is some of the fat richest milk in the world southernmost mammal on the planet. She doesn't know the depths of which she is capable, but her mother does. The mother widow seal will push her baby into the water against her will. She will force her child's head into the water while the baby coughs and sputters and struggles and squirms. She is new here. She does not know that she can breathe underwater until she does. And then everything changes. By the time weaning is over, she will be able to dive 2,500 feet below the water. Stay there for an hour if she wants to. Find a teeny hole she made for air after swimming 12 kilometers away. Move gracefully between frozen and liquid worlds. But she doesn't know. Am I the only one here in a lesson? A coughing, sputtering thrash a struggle to stay who I thought I was, ignorant to what evolution has already written inside me. I feel out of my depth, but really, how would I know? The tough love of the Weddell Sea Mother teaches a lesson about the difference between what is cute and what is necessary. What has been and what could be. And I am grateful for all of my mothers, biological, chosen and ancestral, mammal and otherwise. Like the copperhead snake who greeted me last night, who would shock me into knowing my capacity, trust my lungs more than I thought I could, to breathe in ways I haven't breathed before, to learn my blood in ways I didn't know it. As the Weddell still grows, she will shed her fur, become sleek. She will feel completely at home in the ocean, but avoid it. She will see and feel things no other mammal has felt. But right now she is coughing and spitting and clinging to what she has known. She feels like she is drowning, but she's just meeting herself again for the first time. Love to all my parents and the push of the universe for laughing at me. Thank you to those of you who have pushed through portals already, even out of this life. We can move between worlds. Thank you for those of you living and evolving. The vulnerability of your newness is an example to us all. Thank you to those who hold me accountable, who expect me to be who I need to become. Thank you for ignoring the lies I tell myself about myself. Even in my resistance, I am grateful for you all, for the love you are teaching me, deep, black, and full, for the nurturance, push, and example, what you learn by facing your own death, what you learn in your drowning is my breath. The second I set foot on the beach at Bridgehampton, a whale surfaced and exhaled. From where I stood in occupied sacred Shinnecock land, I couldn't see whether it was a fin whale or a humpback whale. But in my heart, I thought maybe, just maybe it was a North Atlantic right whale. The right whale, the rarest whale in the ocean, hunted nearly into extinction 
to literally fuel the colonial project. Blubber and light. Used to be a right whale could breed for a century. Now that never happens. They rarely live five years without scars from boat propellers, rope wounds from tangled commerce. And it's not necessary. Boats could shift or slow their paths quite easily. You know what is necessary? Breath. Theirs more so than ours, truth be told. Yesterday, I learned that the breathing of whales is as crucial to our own breathing and the carbon cycle of the planet as are the forests of the world. Researchers say, if whales return to their pre-commercial whaling numbers, their gigantic breathing could store as much carbon as 110,000 hectares of forest, or a forest the size of Rocky Mountain National Park. The Shinnecock, now and since forever, including some of my ancestors, are in sacred relationship with the North Atlantic right whale, a listening that spans centuries. Once the beaching of a right whale was an offering to the whole community, nourishment and light, shelter and warmth. But that day on the shoreline, the poet Kathy Engel told me she had never seen a whale in all her 60 years of growing up at the beach until just this summer. Did you call them with your writing? She asked me online. Yes, I have been calling you forever with my blood and with my breathing. I remember what you gave us, which is everything. Light, home, and each other. Love, warmth, and ourselves. If I breathe, I sing your name. I can only breathe because of you. Do you have a century more of breath? And if not, what do I have? Home is light, but loss is heavy. And I cannot live without you. Why would I want to live without you? Steward of centuries, transformer of air, I ever await your message and assignment. In debt and gratitude, in trust and tithe. I see you, I hear you, I know. I dedicate my breathing to the depth you taught, our teaching. You're welcome. That is what the young black tip reef shark who came right up to the shore and accompanied me on the rest of my walk said. What are you doing here? I asked in return. Everyone knows I'm writing about marine mammals, not sharks. And is this even part of your range? She took a deep breath under the water. I was jealous. Maybe I do need gills, I thought, but I didn't say. First of all, she said, that's no way to greet a requiem shark. Do you know who my cousins are? Good point. Tiger shark and them, some of the baddest. But by now she rolled her eyes. But, but by how she rolled her eyes, I could tell she wasn't exactly making a threat. Was I making the wrong assumption? Much respect, I said at last. What was that? The surf is loud. You know my ears are embedded. Much respect, I repeated. Much respect, shark of the live birth who breathes underwater, born whole in yourself in the color of sand, guardian of the reef with your beautiful black edges, breaching brown genius, brave even among sharks, that you show yourself ever is a gift to sky that you showed yourself to me is more than can be expressed i am at your service i am in your death what can i offer okay that's more like it may you please soon outgrow those limits that do nothing to protect you and also pass on this message you're welcome Three lies about sharks that humans used to justify their own violence and alienation that sharks will no longer tolerate. One, sharks travel alone. Translation, 
cultivate your sharp individuality. Paren. Not so. The black tip reef shark, for example, is highly social, finds safety in numbers. Community is the stronger approach. And paren. Two, sharks are powerful and effective because they hide. Translation, no one will love you if they see all of who you are. Paren. Not so. For example, black tip reef sharks jump out of the water and flip in the air four times, even while hunting. You are fierce from every angle. End paren. Three. Sharks spend more time sharpening their teeth than opening their gills. Do we need a translation here? Breathe. And an addendum from me. When even sharks tell you to give peace a chance, you know something has to change. And here are some things I am willing to give up and offering towards our evolution. The sharpness of knowing who I am the weapons I filled my mouth with on purpose, the ways I showed only the tip of me when you needed my wholeness the whole time, the lies I let live in my name, the ways I devalued my breathing. I love each of you for stretching your cartilage and opening your thrills. Thank you for remembering the ancient rule of cycles that the sharks are still protecting. And what a celebration when we realize that our survival need not make us into monsters. When we forgive ourselves for shredding what could never even hurt us. When we evolve as our, as in our assignment of brave guardian vulnerability, we have wondered at the sharpness of teeth, glorified the extremes of alienation. We have fetishized exactly what we fear. And now we are here to notice the miracle that was there the entire time. The gills, the permeability of strength. The gills, the way all life is flowing through you, your breathing. It is your breathing that we need. Chapter three. Remember. What do we remember and what do we forget? How do we name and categorize what we can barely observe? For what purpose and what results? For example, there is only one marine mammal that the dominant scientific community calls by their indigenous name. The, there are supposedly impossible hybrid dolphins along the route of the triangular transatlantic traffic trail of captive human cargo that defy species. There is a battle for the domain name, quote unquote, Amazon, in which a huge corporation has more leverage than the ancient rainforest, a whole region of the planet. What do we need to remember that will push back against the forgetting encouraged by consumer culture and linear time. What can we remember that will surround us in oceans of history and potential? And how? Once upon a time, I thought the name Amazon belonged to Black lesbians. Then I learned that the Amazon was a specific place storied around the world by colonizers who were afraid of the fierceness of the people who would not conform to their ideas about gender and land. I continued to resort, rejoice and to identify. As of this writing, the giant retailer that doesn't even have to be named may be about to win a lawsuit for the domain name Amazon. A lawsuit against the rainforest itself, the whole geographic region. Was it only in 2018 that Colombia acknowledged that a rainforest has rights? And guess what? The only dolphin, and I believe the only marine mammal at all, who has managed to keep her indigenous name, given name, lives in the Amazon. Tukushi, named in the, uh, in the Tuki language, has kept her name through all this colonization 
while most other marine mammals are named after a colonizer at worst and hailed by a bland Western description at best. It's a miracle. We say her name. This is my prayer. May anyone who seeks to mention you be called to learn the language of those who first loved you. May you study the pink of yourself. Know yourself riverine and coast. May you taste the fresh and the salt water of yourself and know what only you can know. May you live in the mouth of the river, meeting place of the tides. May all blessings flow through you. I love you, impossible dolphin, quietest in the river, breathing close to the surface. I'm grateful for what you remember, even if you never say. And I'm keeping your name in my mouth like a river internal, like this love ever flowing. I'm keeping your name in my mouth every day, all day. That's the end of my reading for today. So it's kind of heavy, but kind of um, loving too. I, I really like this book. Um, it, it's just, I think it's wonderful, but um, I'm just curious what kind of other reactions people have. It was it was good to have the closed captioning, but I don't think they got it completely right. <laughs> oh. It was it kind of hard, some of it, so I was just guessing. But um, what a great analogy with marine mammals and uh, breathing and uh, surviving like the the middle passage mm -hmm. did you read that book the middle passage i haven't yet no 